Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi. This is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. Tribe, nation, city, patrimony, heritage, religion, flags, and bumper stickers. Judas Iscariot. Value, opportunity, market, profit, commerce, civilization exploitation and slavery Judas Iscariot Judas Iscariot man of the city Judas Iscariot tribe and city Judas Iscariot securing his future by throwing the ordinary man under the bus nothing changes under the sun. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, verses 14 to 16. You're listening to the Bible as literature. Hi. This is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 394 of the Bible as Literature podcast. We've talked about names like Simon the Leper being highly functional and highly symbolic. And of course, we touched on the name Judas last week because no name is more familiar and more associated with the betrayal of Jesus Christ and his execution than the name Judas. And anyone familiar with Hebrew or Greek, upon hearing the name Judas, will immediately hear the connection to the tribe of Judah, to the region of Judea, and begin to ask questions about what this name represents. And I always love to point out, Richard, when we're dealing with this symbolism, that it pertains to the betrayal of your tribe, those closest to you. It pertains to the betrayal of your patrimony. There's always this tension in Scripture where we feel loyalty to nation, tribe, and patrimony, and that's exactly what God is dynamiting in Genesis, dynasty and tribe and patrimony, because the interest always is in the community that God establishes in the palm of his hand versus the dynasties we tried to build, the civilizations we try to create. So that tension is there already. It's always disappointing and never surprising that people try to use this as a way to say, this group is bad and this group is good. So when we say that Judas represents the people of Judea, which is where the word Jew comes from, it's all the same root in Hebrew, you cannot extract from that an ideology that says anything about modern Jews, period. The only way to hear this text is to hear that your religious community, your tribe, identifies with Judas in the story. Because the function of the inner circle, that is what's being critiqued. There's no group of people that are being critiqued, per se. I just want to say that because fundamentalism is just a disease on the brain. Remember that scripture is a self-critique. Paul was a Pharisee. The school of Paul was a school of Pharisees. The Pharisees wrote the New Testament and presented themselves as the arch villains. That's how you have to hear the text, which means that you have to accept the critique of the New Testament 
as a critique not of somebody else, but as a critique of you. So if you're sitting in a church, you have to assume that the critique of Israel, the critique of Judas, the critique of Judah is a critique of you. But Judas definitely represents those who are closest to Jesus in the story. Exactly. Those closest to Jesus, those who are in the center. In 24 and 25, we saw that it's all about the preparation. And we saw that we have this contrast between those who are at the center of the temple who want to kill Jesus, as opposed to those who live in the house of the poor who honor Jesus and this random woman who decided to coronate Jesus, maybe unbeknownst to her for his burial. And now we have this Judah. So we go back to the story at the beginning of chapter 26 about trying to kill Jesus. We're now talking about how to kill Jesus as opposed to this time. So we shift the scene. We're in Jerusalem. Then we go to Bethany outside of Jerusalem. Now we're going back to Jerusalem and all the wickedness is happening in Jerusalem and all the honor is happening in Bethany. So when Jesus moves from Bethany to Jerusalem here shortly, we're going to see things take a dark turn. I appreciate how you called out this function of Judas as representing the insider community. In Romans, Paul talks about the difference between the Jews and the other nations is that they were given the prophecies and the teachings of God, and then they were responsible for giving it to the other nations. So when there is this critique against the Jews, when I read this, I always read this as a critique against those who have the teaching and don't follow them, which, once we're dealing with a Gentile church, is unfortunately all of us. So we can't distinguish ourselves from the Jews other than the Jews of the Old Testament, the Judeans of the Old Testament. And I appreciate you said this, Father. Jew and Judean in the Old Testament is the same word. They were the first ones to betray this word. Then this word was given to the Gentiles, and then the Gentiles betrayed the word. That's all the difference is, right? This is one of the insiders who has inside access to Jesus, and not only is he not prepared to give to the poor, he's ready to speed along the burial of Jesus and speed along that poverty of teaching that the disciples will have to confront once Jesus is dead. Then one of the twelve, named Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give to me to betray him to you? And they weighed out thirty pieces of silver to him. We talked about the name Judas and its significance and what it represents. It is the tragedy of the story. It's the tragedy of religion, that those who are the most religious are usually the most wicked. That's just how it works. Those who are the most religious are usually almost always the most wicked. You pursue religion, as you explained so eloquently in your commentary on Hosea, Dr. Benton, the way religion functions in Hosea, you pursue religion because you want to pretend you're something that you aren't, and God is not interested in the pretense. Scripture tears and strips away the pretense so that you're left with the truth of what you are, and that's how the self-critique works in Scripture. Instead of pretending you're holy, it leaves you with what you actually are. And when you're left with that, you realize you're no different than anyone else. So there's no need to cover it up with sweet-smelling incense or beautiful garments or interesting ceremony. Not that there's anything wrong with those things, but God doesn't need them. And to the extent that they make you believe the deception that there's something different about you than the average prostitute, they're a problem. And when you believe there's something different between you and the average prostitute, that's when you become twice a child of hell as the Pharisee. That's the teaching of Matthew, as we'll soon hear. It's a very serious matter, and we're about to see exactly how it plays out in the character of Judas, who represents religious delusion and the lie of fealty towards tribe or fealty towards those who you're supposedly 
close to and how that becomes corrupt and deceitful and destructive. This word Iscariot, men of Kirioth, refers to the place that Judas is from. You mentioned, Father, about this passage being about fealty to tribe and fealty to one's own. Let's not gloss over the fact that this is all about money. How are the priests going to keep their power? How are the disciples going to take care of the poor? How much could you have sold the ointment for in order to get the money? And Judas is willing to off his teacher if he's given the right price, and the priests seem to be in the market for hiring a hitman. They've got enough money to do so. There's a lot about money and power here. Let's not gloss over that very basic fact. So in the Old Testament, we have locations that are called Kiryar, Kiryot, or Kiryat. Those are all related to the same thing. But the basic meaning of Kiryat is city or settlement. It means settlement more in Hebrew, but it means more city in Aramaic. So literally, Iscariot can be translated as man of the city. The one who goes to Jerusalem to seek his fortune, and how does he seek his fortune? As a hitman. And hitting who? He's going to off his own teacher. The quest for power and strength is what is undermined by Jesus in visiting the poor, in being honored by those who have very little in the house of the poor. And the one who had the teaching is, in his essence, a hitman, a man of the city. Rich, tribe... The guy's name means tribe and city. It doesn't get worse than that. If I had to come up with two words that would be a stand-in for Antichrist, it would be tribe and city. It's a beautiful name. Judas Iscariot just became like (laughs) one of the top five most interesting names in the Bible. That's fantastic. That is just fantastic. I just want to reread verse 14 for everybody so you now hear it in the context of the rise of Scripture and what Father Paul is saying about civilization and the wilderness. Then one of the twelve named tribe and city (laughs) went to the chief priests. It's fantastic. So tribe and city is going to betray the Messiah. And then you hear it against chapter 12 where Jesus is saying, Tribe and city are done for. Now tribe and city is trying to make a comeback. And who does tribe and city go to speak with? The chief priest. (laughs) And who is tribe and city trying to go after? The ordinary guy, the son of man. And how is tribe and city trying to betray the ordinary guy, the average guy? Through commerce. It's an anti-civilization passage. It's unbelievable, actually, once you make that connection with Kitty Oath, Richard. It's a really astute observation. And, of course, the 30 pieces of silver, most people should be familiar with the references to Exodus and, of course, Zechariah. We don't have to spend a lot of time on that. They're dealing with Jesus, the Son of Man, the ordinary guy, like they would trade in any slave. So you have tribe and city dealing with the chief priest in an exchange of money, which results in the slavery of the sons of Adam. I mean, that's the game they're playing. It's the game of civilization. The result of the game of civilization is slavery. So the allusion to Exodus is very powerful. In Exodus twenty-one thirty-two, if an ox hurts a slave, then you owe the master of that slave 30 shekels of silver. The price of the life of a slave. This is the price of a slave that the priests are willing to give to Judas, interestingly enough, for killing him, because this would somehow make Judas like the master, that he's being recompensed for his murdering of his own teacher, that this is the price of the life of this teacher is a slave, which is correct that he's the slave. And significantly, it would be Judas who would cash in on the death of this slave as if he were the master. But of course he is. As you said, Father, he is Judas, the man of the city. He is the one who is establishing his reign The city walls are built to protect one's riches, one's resources, so that one can control one's own destiny. This is exactly what Judas is doing. And 
he gets there by eliminating the one who would teach that it's shepherdism and it's all in the palm of God's hand. Well, and then that fits very nicely with the passage from Zechariah, which is about the flock that's being led to the slaughter and the wages that are collected are, of course, 30 pieces of silver, 30 shekels. So there it is. You have now the clear tension between civilization, tribe, and the gospel. Right there in the name Judas Iscariot. From then on, he began looking for a good opportunity to betray Jesus. He is going to now earn his wages and do everything in his power to make sure that he extracts the full value of the price of this slave, to make sure that he fulfills his duty to lead this sheep to the slaughter. This is what Judas is going to do for the sake of tribe and city. This is what people do for the sake of religious conviction. This is why just a couple of episodes ago, we were so critical of those who would pollute the gospel with any kind of patriotism or nationalism of any kind, any sort whatsoever, whether it be religious triumphalism or political nationalism or any kind of ideological affiliation of any sort, once you put a bumper sticker on the gospel. My wife, as you know, Richard, grew up in the Soviet Union and came to the U.S. before capitalism changed Eastern Europe after the fall of the Soviet Union. And the first time she and I went for, you know, a drive in the countryside in the United States, she was really scandalized because she could not believe that they put signs up in the countryside advertising products. She was so used to just looking at the countryside. It was shocking for her to see commercials on billboards polluting the countryside. And to this day, she always, always insists, no bumper stickers on cars. She teaches the kids, like, don't put anything on the car. You don't need to make a statement to anyone. And I really appreciate that because it's scriptural. What statement do you need to make? It's Galatians. What mark do you need to put on the outside of your body? Why do you need to distinguish yourself from anybody else? The minute you do that, the minute you make your statement, you're dividing the body of Jesus Christ. You have no business dividing the body of Jesus Christ. The minute you start saying, we're an American church and we need a flag or we're a this or we're a that or I'm a this or I'm a that. The minute you start playing that game, the minute you put your bumper sticker there, you're dividing the body. The minute you divide the body, you are playing the role of Judas Iscariot. You're bringing tribe and city into the discussion and sooner or later, Jesus Christ is going to be put to death again somewhere because of you. It's not a question of maybe or if. It's a question of when. Even if you don't see it happen, it will happen. That's why we're going to be held accountable for the things we say in passing. Because words have consequences. So we have to take seriously this business of not playing the game of the marks on the flesh not becoming a Judas Iscariot who betrays the body of Christ. I like the example, Father, about the billboards because people in business don't waste time grabbing an opportunity to further their business. I mean, you can see that on any motivational poster anywhere, any meme you find about business on LinkedIn, 
it's always going to be about grabbing the opportunity and doing what you can right now, taking advantage of the opportunity, moving, 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 which is the opposite of what the disciples did. This is actually where Judas distinguishes himself. He's ready to move now. I was reading verse 16 in Greek, thinking about the context, because literally it says, Keapotote eziti, so, and from that time he sought evkerian, ev meaning good, and keros meaning opportunity, evkerian, a good opportunity. From that time he sought a good opportunity. You know, here's all these fields. You could put a billboard in it. Why waste the opportunity? We got all these websites with blank space on them. Why don't we fill them with ads? This is a great business opportunity. He was looking for a good opportunity in afton parado, in order to parado, to give over the same verb that comes at the root of paradosis, which is what represents the passing on of the gospel. So in another context... From that time, he sought a good opportunity to pass it along. If you're talking about the gospel, which is perfect, which the disciples did not want to do. But in order to further himself and to further his own power, he sought a good opportunity to further himself and to betray him. And parado can mean both betray somebody or it can mean to pass along something. So in Greek, you can make this play on the word. And so what Judas is doing is correct, except he's doing it for himself, for his own power, for his own strength, as opposed to what he's going to do with the gospel if he were to be a good disciple. He is the anti-disciple because he does precisely what the disciple is supposed to do with the gospel but for his own strength and security. Thanks very much, Dr. Benton. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.